all fast food joints have their fair share of misfortunes. But how did this business bounce back from two failed rebrands, a tainted meat outbreak, and accidentally selling kangaroo meat? Well, Jack in the Box has a few tricks up their sleeve. In the 1960s, Jack in the Box rapidly expanded throughout Southern California. It grew to 24 outlets by 1961 and to 182 just five years later. By the end of the decade, Jack in the Box was 870 units strong. At this point of growth, the multi-tiered food-based corporation Ralston Purina purchased the Jack in the Box parent company and made efforts to convert the restaurant from a West Coast favorite into a nationally known fast food competitor. Hundreds more Jack in the Box outlets opened throughout the Midwest and into the Northeast, but those Jack in the Boxes didn't prove to be especially popular or as profitable. Shortly after opening its 1,000th restaurant in 1980, Jack in the Box announced plans to close 225 financially underperforming locations in the East. It reallocated resources spent on keeping those money-losing restaurants alive into opening dozens of new locations back West. More than 40 years later, Jack in the Box has stuck to that plan. About 43% of its restaurants are situated in California, with most of the rest in Oregon, Washington, Arizona, and Texas. Only a handful of locations still remain along the East Coast and in the Midwest. Along with the early 1980s shutdown of 200 restaurants, Jack in the Box approached the new decade with a series of aggressive business and culinary moves. It alerted the public of changes to come with a TV commercial in which restaurant employees used dynamite to blow up one of the clown heads that adorned the chain's drive through speaker boxes in the 1970s. A newly adopted slogan intoned, The food is better at the box. The food is better at the box. Waste them. Realizing it couldn't outdo McDonald's at their own game, the chain redecorated its restaurants to downplay the clown imagery and brought in new items to attract a wealthier, more mature clientele. Throughout the 80s, Jack in the Box introduced a ham and cheese sandwich, the fajita pita, and fast food's first to-go salad. By 1987, Jack in the Box boasted an extensive 40-item menu, and half of it had made its debut within the past five years. You got omelets? Yes, we do. You got french fries and onion rings? Yes, sir. You got a steak sandwich? We got it. The plan to steer clear of the McDonald's Burger King fight to dominate the burger industry worked. By reinventing itself as a Western U.S. chain in pursuit of a specific niche customer base, Jack in the Box was able to open 400 new stores in the late 1980s. In its core markets of Los Angeles, San Diego, Dallas, and Phoenix, it ranked as the number one or number two fast food chain. Jack in the Box sustained some controversy in the early 1980s. The chain likely but unknowingly served ground horse in its American stores. At the time, imported beef comprised 7% of the American beef supply, and Jack in the Box got some of its meat from a company called ProFreeze, which sourced from Australia. In the summer of 1981, ProFreeze found that some of the Australian product designed for distribution to Jack in the Box wasn't just from cows. It was partially made up of horse meat, too. Back in Australia, inspectors found that more shipments of ground beef intended for the U.S. were also not 100% beef, but contained some kangaroo meat. It all probably meant that ground horse and minced kangaroo had perhaps already made their way into Jack in the Box hamburgers, according to Secretary of Agriculture John R. Block. After the discovery, the Department of Agriculture confiscated and held back 270,000 pounds of boneless meat and 275,000 pounds of ground meat and patties from distribution to fast food outlets, because all of it included at least a trace of horse meat. Hey, if Jack in the Box is really changing, how come he's still here? The clown? By the time you finish this sandwich, he'll be gone. After eliminating the juvenile clown imagery and introducing new food items to appeal to more sophisticated customers, Jack in the Box took an additional, even bolder step toward rebranding. Corporate parent Foodmaker Incorporated changed the name of the chain from Jack in the Box to Monterey Jacks. Executives decided on the name Monterey Jacks because it market tested better than about 200 other Jack based ideas. That same consumer research determined that customers preferred wood and brass decor and a blue color scheme over Jack in the Box's shiny red facades. The new restaurant still offered burgers and fries, but emphasized the recently adopted Jack in the Box additions, like deluxe breakfast sandwiches and salads. 
Monterey Jack's rebirth arrived just as food maker's owner, Ralston Purina, sold the Jack in the Box portfolio to an investment group for $500 million. The new owners approved the overhaul, but were so unhappy with the results less than a year into transforming all the locations into Monterey Jacks, they ordered a reversion to Jack in the Box. In January 1993, Washington State's Department of Health noticed a sudden uptick in cases of hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS, characterized by diarrhea, blood clots, and kidney failure in Seattle children. An investigation revealed that patients had eaten hamburgers at Jack in the Box and had suffered HUS after contracting the foodborne E. coli bacteria. Within weeks, more cases of E. coli were reported in Nevada, Idaho, and California, and more than 700 seriously ill individuals were found to have dined at one of 73 Jack in the Box outlets. Four people died, all children. Federal level health investigators determined that the meat had been contaminated by animal waste at the slaughterhouse level. It also emerged that numerous public health departments in the western U.S. had previously warned Jack in the Box outlets about their refusal to cook beef to a state recommended internal temperature of 155 degrees Fahrenheit, preferring the federal figure of 140 degrees on account of how the extra cooking made patties unpalatable. Thankfully, the U.S. Department of Agriculture now recommends an internal temperature of 160 degrees because the higher temperature kills E. coli bacteria. In the months following the outbreak, Jack in the Box's sales cratered by 35 percent. Hundreds of employees were laid off, and the company halted all advertising in Washington state, delayed plans to open new stores, and asked landlords for a 25 percent rent reduction for one year at 400 outlets, citing economic hardship. In its first couple of decades of life, Jack in the Box's mascot was a stylized clown with a round white head and a painted-on face. In an ongoing marketing campaign launched in the mid-1990s, following the deadly tainted meat scandal, Jack in the Box reimagined its advertising character as a hands-on, eccentric corporate executive, company CEO Jack Box, human from the neck down and topped with a big, cartoonish clown head. Just try my food, apologize, and I'll go. Beat it, clown! Listen, punk! I've spent millions of dollars improving my kitchens to make our best burgers ever! Launched by Dick Sittig, at the Shy Ad Agency, the ad executive took Jack in the Box on as his first client when he started his own firm, Secret Weapon Marketing. The ads are purposely off-kilter, a little dark, and humorous, all in pursuit of a young male customer demographic. Sittig told the Los Angeles Times, Young men like irreverent humor. The commercial successfully reworked the tarnished image of Jack in the Box and inspired a lot of burger purchases, too. In 1995, Jack in the Box took in $1 billion. After Siddiq's quirky ad campaign was established, annual revenues grew to $2.9 billion in a little over a decade. And hey, if I'm saying something that's not true, do something about it. Jack in the Box once again tried to cater to a perceived market niche of fast food customers who wanted something a little bit fancier. In 2004 and 2005, Jack in the Box's parent company converted a handful of pre-existing restaurants into new ones operating under the name JBX Grill. After two test locations in San Diego showed some promise, five more JBX Grills opened in Boise, Idaho, and four more around Bakersfield, California. Dining rooms were designed and decorated more like those of a higher-priced sit-down eatery, with wood floors, overstuffed chairs, and fireplaces. That environment encouraged diners to stay and consume not just hamburgers, but ciabatta bread sandwiches loaded with carne asada, Greek-style chicken, ham and vegetables, or Thai spice, and poblano lime chicken salads. Converting just one jack-in-the-box into a JBX grill cost as much as $400,000. In 2005, when JBX Grills hadn't made up for those expenditures and it began to hurt the entire company's bottom line, Jack in the Box ended the experiment. The company opted not to open any more JBX Grills and chose to change the test outlets back into regular Jack in the Box restaurants. It was a bit daring for Jack in the Box to openly embrace an underserved demographic, hungry marijuana users experiencing the side effect colloquially known as the munchies. I'm looking at the sign and it says 99 tacos for two cents. Dude, it's two tacos for 99 cents. That's even less! Jack in the Box recognized its audience. According to data analyzed by Foursquare in 2016, it's the second most visited fast food chain during overnight hours when inebriation tends to occur, with White Castle in first. 
In 2007, anti-drug groups weren't pleased with an ad that implied a dazed, giggling character orders 99 Jack-in-the-box tacos because he's high on marijuana. Nevertheless, six years later, Jack in the Box introduced Munchie Meals, keeping boxes filled with burgers, tacos, fries, and snack items. To commemorate California legalizing recreational marijuana use, Jack in the Box offered the Merry Munchie Meal locally in 2018, priced at $4.20, a nod to stoner lore, and a date April 20th and time of day 420 at which many consume the drug. The Munchie Meal was a huge success and remains part of the permanent Jack in the Box menu nationwide. In 2003, Jack in the Box expanded its fast food footprint by purchasing a moderate, still growing chain in a different culinary sector that showed a lot of financial promise. It acquired the fast casual Mexican inspired Qdoba for $45 million at a time when it consisted of 85 restaurants in 15 states that generated $65 million in annual sales. The new owner blew up Qdoba into a 700-unit chain, with a presence in 47 states and revenues of $830 million in the year 2017. But traffic at established stores fell so abruptly that within a year, Jack in the Box unloaded the suddenly money-shedding Qdoba to Apollo Global Management for $305 million. One big cause of the financial troubles at Qdoba was a 50% spike in the wholesale price of avocado. Just five years after getting out of the business of selling Mexican-style fast food, Jack in the Box re-entered the arena, paying $585 million to wholly acquire all 600 or so Del Taco locations. Throughout its history, Jack in the Box occasionally experimented with franchising out handfuls of stores to independent operators. But until 2004, the vast majority of its 2,000-plus stores had been company-owned. That year, Jack in the Box transitioned into a franchise model. By 2019, about 95% of its U.S. restaurants were run by franchisees. The year 2019 also marked a demanded regime change, and in December, Jack in the Box chief executive officer, Lenny Kama, resigned, following a two-year period of financial instability and efforts by an organized network of multi-unit franchisees to get the CEO to step down. While Kama and other Jack in the Box executives cut company expenses at the corporate level, hundreds of restaurants reported negative income for 2018, about 300 out of 2,200 Jack in the Box locations, half of which were based in Texas, cited yearly revenues of under $1 million and negative cash flow, losing about $36,000 each on average. Jack in the Box emerged from that dark period with a two-year development plan, in late 2022, it brought in the first new multi-unit franchisees in more than 10 years, signing up 72 entities to open 303 new restaurants. Under those plans, Jack in the Box will open its first stores in Arkansas and head back into Florida after leaving the market over 30 years ago.